Okay. We're all set. Okay, so just to remind you, it's being recorded, and I'll upload this to to YouTube. <clears throat> All right, so derivatives, derivatives, derivatives. <clears throat> so just to let you know too, like section 3.1, that's not on the exam because I was on the last one. Uh, so this is just uh, sections 3.2 to 3.7. So it's going to start with, um, you know, where you first learn how to use the power rule. Uh, and it's going to go all the way through uh, the related rates uh, section. <clears throat> okay, so what I thought I would start going over first off um, was the the um, derivatives of the trig functions, especially when there's a, a power involved uh, and when there's something weird with the angle. Uh, so that was the the PTA method. Uh, that was gone over in the videos and the, in the notes. And you don't have to use it. It's just a, a tool uh, that I found was pretty useful when doing these types of derivatives. So for example, uh, if f of x is equal to uh, sine to the third of 5x squared minus seven X plus one, you can organize it by going P and then the T and then the A. So in that, in that method, what did the P stand for? Uh, power. That was the power. <clears throat> so, and it's talking about the power of the trig function. It's not talking about like any power that was in your exponent or inside the angle. Uh, so it's strictly about the, the exponent or the power that's on the trig function. So you're just going to treat it just like the power rule. So you're going to take this three and you're going to pull it down. And when you use the power rule, like right after you pull the exponent down, what was the next thing that you would do? Like if you were trying to find the derivative of x squared, you know, you pulled the power down, but then what was the next thing you would write? Uh, well, you would write the x in that case. Yeah. yeah, so it was you wrote the thing that had the power on it. So that's the same thing with this. Like you're not jumping around to something different. You're still using the power rule. So the, the thing that had the power on it was the sine. And then you decrease the power by one. And then the angle stays exactly the same. And what a lot of people want to do is they want to replace the angle with something else. And you never do that. You never replace the angle uh, with something. Just leave the angle alone. Don't touch. <laughs> okay, so that's just the power. So, I mean, it looks like you've just done a bunch of, of stuff there, but you really haven't. You've only just supplied the power part. So now you can jump to the trig. <clears throat> Someone's upset out there. Um, so that's going to be the derivative of just the trig function. <clears throat> so the just the trig function is just sine. So what's the derivative of sine? Cosine. Cosine. And then the angle stays the same.
And then you can move to the A, and now you're finally dealing with the angle, and you're not going to change it. And so we've kept the angle the same. All you're going to do is multiply by the derivative of your angle. So what's the derivative of 5x squared minus 7x plus 1? Uh, 10x minus 7, right? Yeah. So these derivatives are kind of weird because they end up being a lot of times a lot more complicated than your original function, which is okay. A lot of a lot of functions will tend to do that on your trig functions, especially. So the only thing from here is to just multiply any constants together, combine anything. So that'd be like the three and the ten x minus seven. Um, it's like 30x minus 21. So it's sine squared of 5x squared minus 7x plus 1 times cosine of 5x squared minus 7x plus 1. <laughs> That is your final derivative. So they're all going to work pretty much in that same fashion. So it doesn't matter if it's sine, cosine, tangent. It doesn't matter what the power is. It doesn't matter what the angle is. You can still follow that process no, no matter what you have, which is kind of nice. That's why we like to use it because uh, it doesn't. The process doesn't change, even though the function does. <laughs> Okay, so what do you guys think? Are you guys good on, on that? Do you want to do another one? Good. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so there was PTA. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about just derivative rules in general. So we've already already used the power rule. What types of things are you allowed to use the power rule uh, with? So like what type of, of functions or terms or things can you use it with? Uh, polynomials. Uh huh. Yeah, any sort of polynomial. So like x squared minus seven x plus eight x to the third, and so on and so forth. Um, uh. Uh, what else? Um, can't you use it just on like a, a linear equation? Okay. Yeah. I mean, that would still be classified under Same a polynomial. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can use them on radicals. Uh, the thing about those is that you have to change the radical around to an exponent. So like the square root of X, um, you, don't, you don't really just leave it like that. You would change it to what? X to the half. X to the half. Okay. So a lot of people just know that the square root of X is equal to X to the half, but they get a little fuzzy when it's something different. So like, what's the cube root of X? What does that turn into? X to the third. X to the third. Okay, so what is the, oh. the rule? Sorry, I didn't realize that I was um, unmuted there. Whoops. 
Oh, that's okay. It was still correct. <laughs> so like if we had the fifth root of x squared, you know, that's going to switch around too. But a lot, um, I, I see it happen in calculus a lot. Like people just freeze and they don't know what to do with that because it's a little different. So how do you decide what the fraction exponent is going to be? Uh, the way I, th is that the fifth root of X squared? Yeah, fifth root of X squared. I think of it as like, when I see one of those as like, um, I'm going to make a fraction and uh, whatever is inside the radical, whatever uh, power that is um, put to, I'm going to put that on the top of the radical. Yeah. So it's going to be like to the second, to the two over, and then the other number, which is going to be five. Yeah. Nice. I had a um, chemistry teacher back in the day. And he did it like this, like the R was for like the type of radical and the E so for exponent. And so he made it X to the E R like that, and just with a fraction bar in there. So I don't know, kind of stuck in a lot of people's heads, but, but yeah, he's exactly right. The exponent on the inside is the numerator. The type of radical is always going to be your denominator. Okay. So these two things probably make up the majority of where you're going to use the power rule. Uh, what are some things where you can't use it? Can you think of a, a function or an example where you wouldn't be allowed to use the product rule, even though you, or, um, the power rule, even though you might really want to? Well, like, what about e to the u or whatever, yeah. or e to the s, that type of? Yeah, and all those exponentials. And it's so tempting to want to wanna, um, to use it, but you can't. So she's exactly right, like e to the x. Like you can't just pull, you know, the x down and then decrease the power by one. Like that is so not allowed. So the exponentials, they have their own uh, derivative rule or process that we have to follow. Uh, so that's probably the, the biggest one that I see where people uh, use the power rule incorrectly. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, the other one where I see it a lot would be um, with rational functions. So like if we had something you know, like one all over uh, x squared uh, minus three x, something like that. What I'll see a lot of people do is they just go, oh, let's just use the power rule in the denominator and say that's just one over two X minus three, which is really tempting. And that would be really nice because it would be really easy to do, but you can't do that. Uh, so like for this one, what would you have to do instead? You actually have two options. Um. The quotient rule? Yeah, you can use the quotient rule. Uh, or what's another way? Well, uh, could you just put that, um, that denominator to the negative one and then use the power rule? Yep. Yeah, anytime your numerator is just a constant, so like one or two or 17 or whatever, the fastest way is to just flip the denominator up <clears throat> and then use the chain rule on it. It's like negative one X squared minus three X. So now the negative two 
and then multiply by the derivative of uh, the inside. So you do end up with the two x minus three, but it's not going to be where we put it uh, originally. <clears throat> okay, so that's just some things to kind of watch out for uh, when you use the, the power rule, because it's easy, but it's also easy to, to make a mistake with uh, if you're just not paying attention. Okay, so we went over the, uh, the, the power rule. Uh, and then in the next section in 3.3, there was the, the product rule and also the quotient rule. So the product rule you would use if you have like two functions being multiplied together. Uh, so like two X uh, times sine of X or e to the X times tangent of X or X ln of X, something uh, like that, or even like two quantities of polynomials, so you wouldn't have to foil it. Uh, so anyway, anyway, what is the the rule? So if you have f times g, what is the product rule? Um, I always say like uh, f prime of x times g of x mm -hmm. plus f of x times g prime of x. That's the order that, that I say it in. Okay, yeah, that's totally fine. As long as it's in this format somehow, like you could have these two flipped around or these two flipped around, that's totally fine. Okay, and then we did the quotient rule. So we had two functions divided. And the quotient rule, uh, we talked about it and use it specifically when the numerator was not a constant. So not something like this last one where you had a one up there. Like you can totally use it, but you're kind of doing the long way if you do. Um, but if that's all you can think of, then there you go. Okay, so what's the quotient rule? Like what would go up here? Uh, F prime of X times G of X, and then minus uh, F of X times G prime of X. Okay. And then underneath? G of X squared. Yeah. G of X squared. Um, that's probably a common mistake too, is a lot of people forget to just stick the denominator in there and they just do the top. Uh, so make sure that when you use a quotient rule, you still have a fraction after you use the rule. It might simplify down to something that's not a fraction, but um, at least when you use the rule, you're still gonna get a fraction out of it. All right, then we moved on into 3.4 and it talked about the chain rule. And this is where the floodgates kind of came wide open. Um, so we were able to now kind of basically throw in any function that we could ever possibly think of um, and try to find its derivative. So this is where you have like a function inside of another one. So like a composite function. So what was the rule for that? Uh, it's f prime of g of x and then times g prime of x. Yeah. Okay, so examples would be 
uh, like f of x is equal to uh, 3x minus 4 all to the seventh. So then you're using the chain rule. So you're just pulling the power down. You decrease the power by one. So that's this f prime of g of x. And then you still have to do the g prime of x. So the g prime of x is the derivative of whatever's inside. So then just the derivative of 3x minus 4, which is usually what? 3. 3. And then multiply your constants out. So 21 times 3x minus 4 uh, to the 6. Oops. All right, let's try another one with the chain rule, and then I'm going to throw you a little curve ball. Uh, so let's do uh, the square root of ln of X minus one. Yeah, let's just do that. <laughs> Actually, this might not be be the best example to use when I think of it. <clears throat> Let me do it. Let's go e to the x plus 5x. We'll try that one. We'll go back to that one with Ellen uh, in a little bit. Uh, not just yet. Okay, so how would you approach this with this uh, radical here? Maybe you would first like uh, rewrite it um, okay. uh, with, uh, with fractional exponents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you can either rewrite it or think it in your head either way. All right, so now you can run through the chain rule again. So I'll pull the one half down. You're going to decrease the exponent by one. So one half minus one is a negative half. And then you need to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So what's the derivative of e to the x plus 5x? e to the x plus 5. Yeah. Okay, so this one, there really isn't a whole lot you can do. Like if you multiply stuff together, things don't really simplify or like actually multiply out. So this one, it would be totally fine if you left it uh, like for if, if it was a free response question. Um, however, if it's multiple choice, you do have to be aware of your options. So like this would be a perfectly acceptable answer but what else could you do to it? Like what would be an option, optional uh, format you could put this in? Uh, put it um, in brackets. Uh, do what? Two of you said something at the same time, so it kind of got jumbled together. I'm sorry, I said, I said uh, uh, put it in a fraction. Okay. Yeah, so this e to the x plus 5 will stay on top. And then you can flip this negative exponent down underneath. And 
And then what's the third option? And then put it back into a radical. Yeah. So if it was multiple choice, you know, the multiple choice could have one of these three options. So you do have to be aware sometimes of what you can turn uh, your, your answer into uh, for, those, for those questions. If it's free response, you could have any of these three and that would be totally fine. Um, if it was free response back to this first one, you do need to multiply the three and the seven together to give you a, a 21 because that does simplify down, whereas this one doesn't really simplify, it just changes. Okay, let me give you a different one. Let's say h of x is equal to f of root x, and that's all you have. But the question still wants to know what is the derivative of h? So this is still going to require the chain rule, but this is where you really have to know what the chain rule is and how, how it works. <clears throat> So you're kind of going back to your little definition here, and you're just kind of following it straight out. So just like the chain rule says, it's just going to be right here. <clears throat> so it's going to start out as f prime of root x. But then you need to keep going. You got to multiply it by the g prime of x. So what exactly is this g prime of x going to be? Or what are you taking the derivative of now? x to the half. x to the half, or that square root of x. Uh, so what's the derivative of root x? 1 half x to the negative half. Yeah. <clears throat> so the chain rule can be used with like specific, specific functions. Um, or it can be used in kind of a general format, uh, but it can still be used. So let's say um, g of x is equal to tangent of f of x. What do you think the derivative is for that? So, so first you would take the derivative of uh, tangent of f of x, which would be okay. a secant squared of f of x, I think. Yeah. And then uh, I guess if you just follow the rule, then you would just uh, multiply that by f prime of x. Nice. Yeah, that is exactly right. And this is all you can do with it. Like you could do more possibly if you knew what f of x was, but you don't. Um, so that's where it kind of trips people up because they want something specific as opposed to something general. Um, <clears throat> so if you don't know what a function is and they still want the derivative, all you can say is, well, it's just f prime of x. And that, that's it. And you just have to leave it which is weird, but possible. Uh, okay, do you have any questions on this chain rule stuff? All right, I'm going to take that as a new. <laughs> okay, 
So that was 3.4. Then we moved on to 3.5. Do you remember what that was about? Uh, implicit uh, differentiation? Yeah. So what's the thing about implicit? Like, how do you know um, when you're supposed to use it? Like, if they don't tell you to use it, like, how would you know? Uh, maybe if you see, like, x's and y's on, like, both sides of the equation. Yeah, x's and y's on both sides, or, or at least together. Um, right. So, like, 2xy minus three y squared is equal to four. So this one I would totally use implicit with because you have x's and y's together uh, and you couldn't easily solve for y. <clears throat> if you had, um, let's just make it easy, two uh, x minus five y is equal to eight, I would not use implicit with this because it would be easy to solve for y. Like you could totally get y by itself. <clears throat> and now you can just get its derivative, which would be a, a little bit faster than trying to run through implicit. Like you could use implicit if you, if you still want to. Um, but sometimes it's easier if you solve for y. This first function, that's not going to be <laughs> very easy to do. Uh, you'd have to use a quadratic formula, and then it's just going to get pretty massive from there. Um, so if it's something like that, you could use you're going to need to use implicit. If it's something like this, now you've got an option. Unless it tells you you have to use implicit, then there's no option, then you just have to do it. All right, let's look at that first one again. 2xy minus 3y squared is equal to 4. So when you're running through implicit differentiation, um, all the rules are the same. So you still have the power rule, product rule, chain rule, quotient rule. Um, but they kind of sneak in this other little rule or other little thing that you have to do when you're going through the derivative. So what was that little extra piece? Uh, whenever you take the derivative of a term that includes y, then you have to multiply by uh, uh, dy over dx. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether you want to do it or not, you still have to do it. Um, so why is that? Because it does seem weird. It's like, well, wait, why do we have to do that? We've never really done that before. But in actuality, you have. Uh, in fact, we just did it right here. Because uh, what's another notation that you could use for a y prime? Uh, dy over dx? Yeah. So you do this every single time you do the derivative of a y anyway. It's just now you're going to do it with every single y that you see. Uh, so whether it's the y is by itself or it's in a mess like this, you're still going to do the dy dx. Because <clears throat> it's, it's kind of like a placeholder. It's, it's accounting for the derivative of y, even though you don't know what y equals, whereas here you do. <clears throat> All right, so we got to run through the derivative for this. So we got to do the derivative of 2xy. So what rule is going to come into play? Uh, product rule. Product rule. Unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, so the derivative of 2x would just be 2 times y. 
And then plus, you can repeat the 2x. And now you're going to do the derivative of, of y, which is going to be 1 times dy over dx. Yeah. OK, so now you can move on to the negative 3y squared. So this one's just the, a straight power rule. So you know, pull the exponent down. But you just did the derivative of a y term. So you got to do that times dy dx. And then it's going to equal uh, what? What's the derivative of 4? Uh, usually 0. Yeah. And this is where something that would be easy to check, because sometimes when you're doing this implicit stuff, if it's coming out weird, you're like, this doesn't seem right. Or if it's like a multiple choice question in this answer, what you're getting is not one of the choices. Check that. Make sure that when you did the derivative of the constant, you made it 0. Because uh, a lot of the time, I'd say at least 50% of the time, that's the mistake. Uh, a lot of people just forget or they're going too fast. And I've done it myself, where you just leave the four as a four instead of doing a derivative. <clears throat> All right, so how would you proceed from here? Or like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to solve for? Uh, that dy over dx. Yeah, so you need to get this dy dx by itself. So you want to group them all together on the same side. And if it doesn't have a dy x on it, uh, you got to move it over to the other side. So this 2y that's in the front, we're going to swing it around to the back. And at the same time, let's pull out your dy dx. So inside, you're left with 2x minus 6y. And it's equal to negative 2y. So then you only have one more step. And that's just to divide by what's in the parentheses. Yeah. And then once you have it, you know, the dy dx by itself and you've got a fraction, then you can see if the fraction reduces and this one does, because uh, what could you do to it? Oh, factor out two? Yeah, you can cancel a two out from everything. So negative y over x minus three y. And sometimes like what the book wanted to do, and I'm not sure why it likes to do this, but I noticed that in their answer key, like in the back of the book, if it was a homework problem, sometimes they don't like the numerator to just be negative. So they'll flip all the signs. This is something you do not have to do. Um, but if you were ever wondering, like, why do they always put it like that? Or how did they get there? That's all they did. Just flip every single sign and there you go. All right, let's try one more of these, but we'll make it a little different. So we're going to find the slope of the tangent line um, of uh, 
uh, sine x plus y squared is equal to nine uh, at the point zero three. So with this one, there are two different routes you can take to get to the answer. One route is, is long and the other route is short. Um, they'll start the same way, but then they're gonna split depending on what you decide to do. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll show you how I would do it once we get there. So to start, you, you have to take the derivative uh, using implicit. So what would be uh, the derivative of sine? Cosine. Cosine. And then the derivative of y squared. Uh, 2y dy dx? Yeah. And then it's going to equal zero. So this one's pretty simple. So it wouldn't take a lot of effort to solve for that dy dx. Uh, but if we had one like this, where you've got more than one, um, one option is to solve for that dy dx and get it by itself, just like we did up there. The other, um, which I like to use, is to now just plug in your point and for the X and for the Y, because if you do that, then it eliminates all your variables except for the DY and the X. And it's a lot quicker to solve and because um, you don't have as many variables running around. Because it didn't ask you to find DY DX, it just wants the slope. So if it didn't ask for DY DX, you don't actually have to give it, they just want the value. So just start sticking in your, your point uh, from here. And then it's a lot quicker. Uh, so plug in the zero for the X. Plug in the three for the Y. And a lot of times when you plug this in, like you can do stuff in your head too. I'm just writing it out so everybody can see it. Uh, and then just start to evaluate and do stuff. So like what's cosine of zero? One. And then we can multiply the three and the two together. And then you can quickly solve for your dy dx. Oops. So it's just negative one, six. So that's what I like to do. Um, I usually, <laughs> they just want the slope. I don't bother trying to get the dy dx by itself in the beginning and then plug it in. Uh, I plug it in right away. <clears throat> okay, do you guys have any questions on implicit or like anything from here? Oh, um, well, I don't know if now is a good time to ask because maybe we'll have Q&A later, but I had a question from the homework uh, for 3.5. Um, was it with a first or second derivative? Uh, this was with a first, um, yeah, with the trig function. what time is it yeah i think we can do that um do you remember what it was uh yeah um yes so well i know it was uh number 29 on 3.5 and i have the question i can get it real quick uh, i think it's yeah so the question is uh tangent of x plus y equals x all right. And we're supposed to find uh, probably uh, is it um, the equation of 
the line that's tangent to the point zero zero, either that or like the uh, or or the slope of the tangent line at zero zero. And what's the slope of the tangent line at zero zero? Or the or the tangent line itself, or both. Oh, yeah, uh, you know, it just says evaluate the derivative. So just so just oh, the, the slope. Just yeah. slope. Okay. And uh, what was the uh, function again or equation? Yeah, it's a, a tangent of x plus y. Like the angle is x plus y? Like that? Right, yes. And then uh, that equals x. At zero, zero. Okay, so um, the derivative of tangent would be secant squared. Your angle stays the same. But now you have to multiply by the derivative of your angle. So the derivative of x would just be 1. The derivative of y would be 1 dy dx. And then it's going to equal the derivative of x, which is just 1. So since I or they're just asking for the you to evaluate, right? Yeah, at that yeah. point. Yeah. So, so they just want you to evaluate. I would just stick in the zero for x and y and go from there. Um, I'll show you what to do if they wanted the derivative of y, but let's just finish it. Um, oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it actually does say to find the derivative. Oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Then let's do that. So you have an option here. One option is to distribute your secant squared of x plus y uh, into the brackets and then subtract, move things over, divide, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, or you can divide everything by secant, secant squared, uh, which I think that's what I would do. Just so you get the dy dx pretty much all by itself. Because if you divide one by secant squared, it just turns into cosine squared. And then to finish it, you just have to subtract one. Oh, OK. Yeah. And then you'll get like sine, uh, sine, sine squared, right? Uh, you could if, yeah, you wouldn't have to. Yeah. Um, is that what the, the book had as their answer was sine squared? Uh, I, I forget, um, uh, okay. to be honest, but I want to yeah. say they, I want to say they don't, and they might have, their answer might actually be a big fraction, but if you take their fraction and if you split it, it would simplify right into this. Cause I think they went the option of distributing the secant squared, uh, which is fine. Um, to me, it's just more work. Okay, so then at zero, zero. Yeah, cosine squared of zero. And then minus one. So cosine of zero is? is one, one, and then minus one, so zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the book did um, distribute that, which is probably where I was getting lost because that I, I guess I didn't even think of that because that seems uh, a little a little rough. <laughs> uh, a little bit. Okay, well, thank you. Good. Sure. So actually, that was good that we're, we did that one. So now that you know that the derivative is zero, what does this tell you? Um, well, if the derivative is zero, then the slope is zero there. So what does that tell you that the, that the function's like horizontal at that point or? Um, well, not that the, the function is horizontal, but that you have a, Because you're right, it doesn't mean the slope is zero, but the slope of what? 
that's the slope of the uh, derivative is zero. I mean, yeah, right. The slope of the function is zero, but the, like <clears throat> that's telling you that like this slope, like, yeah, it's the slope of the function, but it's also the slope of the tangent. Oh, line. that, oh, okay. Yeah, so whenever the slope, like, or whenever the derivative comes out to zero, yeah, that does imply that your the slope is zero, but they're, they're usually referring to the slope of the tangent line. So if your slope is zero, you have a horizontal tangent line. At that specific point. So for this one, it was at the point zero, zero. <clears throat> so we're gonna see a lot more of that in uh, chapter four. Uh, because chapter four is going to start to build on the derivative and go, okay, now that you know how to find it. Um, so if I give you a function and I tell you to find the derivative, now we're going to look at what you can do with it <clears throat> beyond like acceleration uh, velocity and that type of stuff. Like what does the derivative actually tell you uh, in regards to the function? Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so something else that was in that section along with implicit, and it was kind of, it was right at the end of it, was the logarithmic differentiation. <clears throat> so it was used with functions that would be a little bit more difficult to find the derivative of. Um, like they were typically already in terms of y, but if you left it the way it is, like you would be doing all sorts of crazy rules all at once. So there'd be like a product rule and within a quotient rule, within a chain rule, which is doable, but um, no one wants to do that. <clears throat> so I don't know what's if it was actually we'll do two different ones. I mean it's something like uh, x plus one or x times x plus one times x minus five. You know, something like that. So you could expand all that out. I wish this one might not be that hard to do, but if it told you that you had to use logarithmic differentiation, then you can't expand it and go from there. So if you're supposed to use a logarithmic differentiation, what does that mean? Or like, what is it telling you to do? Um, uh, to take like the LN, our natural log of both sides. Yeah. which seems really weird. Like, oh my gosh, now we have to deal with a log or an LN. And it's like, yeah, no, you do, but logarithms have some neat little properties, mainly in that they break apart uh, products, they break apart quotients, um, they pull exponents down. So it may, it takes like a really complex function and it kind of pulls it apart it makes it a little bit easier to deal with. So like ln of x is ln of x plus one plus ln of x minus five, because now the derivative is really fast. But one thing you have to remember though, is that when you do the, the derivative of that ln, you're still, you're gonna need to use implicit. So it's one over y times dy dx. And then over here on the right side, everything's just as, just like normal. So what's the derivative of ln of x? Uh, one over x. Okay, the derivative of ln of x plus one. 
uh, one over X plus one. Yeah. So the derivative of the last term. And if you're wondering how he's doing that so quickly, you know, you take whatever's in the LN, you put it in the denominator. And then you take the denominator, take its derivative, and stick it up top. And then from here, typically you would just, you know, combine your fractions together if you end up with any. Um, but I'm going to assume you know how to do that. So we're going to skip over that part. Um, so you combine them together and then you would multiply by y. And then you don't want to leave it just as y though, because you know what y equals. So you switch the y back out. with what it was in the beginning. I ran out of room. Ah, in the video code. Um, when you say uh, you trust that we can like deal with the fractions, you just mean um, uh, grab a common denominator and, uh, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Which actually this one, <clears throat> yeah, you could, yeah, I get a common denominator. Um, yeah, and just start to, to simplify. So from there, it's just the algebra. <clears throat> okay. So just make sure if it tells you to use logarithmic differentiation um, that you use it. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't tell you to, you could use it just on your own if you wanted. Um, because it's a perfectly valid choice, uh, especially if you've got a really big giant function. <laughs> okay, so that was 3.5, 3.6. Um, that was the inverse uh, trig functions. And we're gonna stick with just this, the same three that we talked about in the, the videos and the notes. And those were which ones? Like which three did we uh, focus on? So, because technically there's six of them, but we only did, worked with three. Inverse sign? Yeah. Uh, what was the second? What was it on uh, inverse tangent? Inverse tangent. And most of our examples were with just those two, but we did uh, a couple with the third. And that was. Arc secant. Which one? Is it arc secant? Yeah. Oh, cool. Arc Sorry. Secant. Yeah, or inverse secant, either way. Now, um, I also have another question. Yeah. Can you solve, um, after, this, after this, can you solve a problem from the, from the study guide? Uh, sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so for the exam, it's just these three. Um, and it's usually not going to be just inverse sine of x or inverse tangent of x. There's going to be like something else in there besides x. So like if um, f of x was equal to inverse sine, 
of x squared uh, minus eight. The derivative is going to be a, a fraction. And for inverse sine, it has a square root in the denominator. And inside the radical, it always started out as 1 minus something. So what was the something that you would put in like right here? In the numerator, it's 2x because of the u prime. OK. So but uh, I was talking about like right here in the, oh. inside the radical. Inside the radical uh, would be 1 minus, uh, I guess, all of like the entire function besides the sine, the inverse sine squared. So x squared minus 8 squared. Yeah. So yeah, you just take whatever's inside the arc sine, stick it in the radical and square it. And then on the numerator, he was right, it is a 2x. So where's the 2x coming from? It's the derivative of x squared minus 8. Yeah, it's just the derivative of the inside again. Um, and then you can simplify. If you can simplify, um, it's like this one. The only thing you can really do think is just expand what's inside the radical. So like foil this x squared minus eight out and distribute uh, the negative. So it'd be negative x to the fourth plus 16 x squared uh, minus 64. And then you can combine the one and the negative 64 So negative x to the fourth plus 16x squared minus 63. And with this one, that's all you can do. Like it doesn't factor anymore. There's nothing to pull out. So it's done. Okay, so that was 3.6. And then the last one, 3.7, was on the related rates. <clears throat> and um, in the notes, I walked you through, at least in most of those example, uh, examples, um, like a process to use and something that kind of helped you organize uh, what you were supposed to do. And it kind of organized the problem, the data, and so on and so forth. So um, you had to put in like three, or we used three different categories. Uh, what were the three categories? Anybody remember? No. Okay. Actually, you just said one of them. Cool. Just not the right no. But one, the first category was no. So it's stuff that you knew about the problem, um, like formulas that you've already 
known before. Um, it's like area, formulas, volume, um, Pythagorean theorem, trig functions, um, that sort of thing. So stuff that should already be in your head before you, you went over the problem. <clears throat> your second category was given. And that was like any data that was in the problem. <clears throat> so like if they specifically told you that a side was 10 feet long or something was moving at two meters per second, uh, stuff like that. And then the third category, <laughs> Uh, was what? Find. Find. So this is what you were trying to find or what are you trying to do? Or what are you solving for? And the question has to tell you, you know, what you're solving for. Otherwise you have no idea. Uh, so it's usually uh, a rate uh, or it might be, <coughs> side or something but it definitely tells you like what you're actually trying to do <clears throat> okay so let's okay let's try this one so a sphere Uh, is expanding at a rate of uh, Evan Jefferson, what's your favorite number? Uh, 42. 42, okay. Okay, so a sphere is expanding at a rate of uh, 42 cubic centimeters per minute. So how fast is radius changing? when the radius is, we'll choose a smaller number, uh, three. Three centimeters. Okay, so let's set up the no, uh, the given and the find. Um, if you don't, let me just say this too. If you don't use the no given and the find, that's totally, that's perfectly acceptable. Like you don't have to use it. So if you can just run through it yourself using some other method or just doing it, you know, go for it. Um, this is just a tool to help you if you're just kind of stuck or don't know exactly what to do until you start writing stuff out. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the stuff that you know. So based on like what is said in the problem, like your, the shape you're working with is a sphere. So the sphere itself is expanding uh, this fast. So what type of thing about the sphere would you be working with? And with spheres, you really only have two options. You're either working with surface area or volume. So which one do you think it is? You want to go with the volume or do you want to go with the surface area? S 
surface area? It's actually going to be volume. And one thing that can help you kind of decide is look at the, the units and what they provided. So if it's filling up or expanding at a rate of cubic whatever, that's always going to be a volume. Because the units for volume are always like cubic feet or cubic centimeters or cubic inches. If it was centimeters squared, then you'd be talking about the surface area because that's the unit for area. All right, so we're working with the volume of a sphere. And what is the formula for the volume of a sphere? All the way back from geometry. Um, four over three pi r cubed. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so that's our no. This is the formula that we known or gone over before this before this class. <clears throat> so now you're given uh, or any like actual values that were stated in the problem. So we have this 42 cubic centimeters per minute. Um, so what is this actually going with? Is it like a length? Is it a rate? Like, what is it? And you can't say, well, I don't know. You just have to read the problem. Isn't that just like a, a volume expansion or a growth rate? Yeah. So it's the rate of the volume. So how do we normally label the rate of the volume? Like you don't really write it out with words. You would, what symbol would you use for it for notation? Well, um, isn't it just like what you have right there, like uh, 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 cubic centimeters per, per minute? So that would be the 42, but what would you put right here? Do you put dv over dt? Yeah, dv over dt. When you're talking about a rate, that's always going to be d something over dt. So since in this case, it's the rate of the volume, it's dv over dt. If it was the rate of um, the area, then it would be dA over dt. Um, if it was the side x that was changing, it would be dx dt, uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, and then what else, what other numerical values are given to you? The radius? The radius. OK, so we have our DVDT, we have our radius. And what exactly are they trying to find? So that would be how fast is the radius changing? Or uh, what is the rate of the radius? So if it's the rate of the radius, um, what notation would we use for that one? We just talked about it for the regular of the volume. Is it dr over dt? Yeah. So 
So this is what they want you to find. They want you to get a value for this, this DRDT. So it's gonna come out as like five or seven over four, whatever. <clears throat> okay, so this is what you want, they want you to find, but it is nowhere in this no equation. So how do you get this to show up from that equation or that formula? Like what do you have to do with this thing right here so that this comes into play? Is it the radius again? Like you plug in three for R or? Um, no, if we plug in three right now, that would tell you what the volume is, which is fun, but it's not what it's asking you to do. Um, so if you're going, well, how do I get this to show up? What has this whole chapter been about? Like if I asked you to describe the chapter in one word, what would you tell me? Derivatives. Derivatives. So how do you get this to show up? Derivative. So you have to take the derivative of this formula, whatever is sitting right in the no category uh, with respect to T. So the derivative of V is gonna be dV dt. And then over here on the right side, your four thirds is just a constant, pi is a constant. So they just stay as they are. And now you can do the derivative of r to the third. So three r squared times your dr dt. So now you've got a dr dt that showed up and now you can start plugging in your, your givens. <clears throat> So your DVT, dv dt, actually, let me simplify this down. So if we simplify the right side, the threes cancel out. Now you can plug in the 42. You can plug in the three. And now you can get the DRDT by itself. Okay, so let's do a little um, mental math. Uh, what is three squared? Nine. Nine times four? 36. 36. And the pi just says is pi. And we can simplify the fraction if, if possible. Um, <clears throat> so what goes into 42 and 36? Uh, 6. 6. So just cancel 6 out of them. So 7 over 6 pi. And with these problems, they're typically going to have some sort of a unit involved uh, in the problem itself, which means that you need to also give a unit for your answer. So what would be the units uh, for this? It'd be 7 over 6 pi uh, what? It's asking um, how quickly is the volume expanding, right? No, that was what you were given. It wants to know how fast is the radius changing. I'm sorry. Okay, so that should be um, uh, what centimeters per minute. Yep. Yeah. And if you're sitting there going, "Well, how do I figure that out?" You know, just think about what types of units you would use for a radius. 
you know, radius is always centimeters, oops, um, just centimeters or just feet or just inches or whatever. So there's no exponent on it. If it was a volume, that would be seven, uh, centimeters cubed per minute. If it was an area, that would be centimeters squared per minute. But if it's a length, then it's just centimeters per minute or feet per minute or meters per second or something like that. <clears throat> Uh, but you definitely want to give the units. <clears throat> okay, um, what questions do you have on this one that we just did? Uh, I don't know if anybody else is in the same boat, but I, I haven't done this section yet. Uh, I'm going to work on it today. So, oh, okay. so I don't have any questions. I don't know if like <laughs> anybody else is in the same boat. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. So, I don't know. That's, that's fine with me. Everyone works at their own pace. <clears throat> which, which section is this? This is 3.7. Oh, uh, this is on the exam? Yeah. Oh, Okay. And yeah, then, the um, last page of the syllabus has the content of every exam and, the, and every quiz. <clears throat> got it. Uh, wait, could you go over um, on, the, on the study guide? It was the second page. It's uh, question 11. Okay. Um, so before I do, any other questions on this, though? No. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm going to take that as a note. Okay, you said number 11 from the study guide, the, is the baseball diamond? Yeah, is, is, that, is that on 3.7? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, I haven't started 3.7 yet, so I'll start that today then. You haven't done 3.7 yet either? I haven't. Yeah. Okay, so then why are we going over a problem that you haven't done yet? Uh, uh, good, not, uh, I didn't know it was fifty point seven till for now. So, um, I guess I'll I'll just uh work on three point seven. So you don't have to go over it. You don't have to go over it then. Okay. Uh, does anybody else want it that actually has done the section? Okay. Um, all right, what stuff do you guys want to ask about? Like, what do you want to see? What do you want to? Um, I have, oh, actually, well, I have two other questions that I wanted to ask. Um, um, one is from section 3.3, .3, and 3.3 .3 was like, uh, is that like quotient rule and stuff? Maybe, yeah. Um, and then I also had a question, if I'm allowed to ask, um, about number 13 from the last exam, just because I was confused about one of those, if it's, uh, if we're able to discuss it. Okay. Um, I mean, it might be kind of yeah. off topic, but also it might be kind of quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's do the 3.3 question first. Um, was the uh, question 13 from the exam, was it um, on continuity or limits? It was, uh, yeah, it was evaluating a limit of, um, I had a fraction that involved um, some natural logs, I think, to exponents. And I just like got it totally wrong. And I, I think I made an out, or I think I, Messed up on the algebra, but uh, if we if we can't go over it now, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, because so what I'm thinking of, uh, I think you just um, <clears throat> you you pull the power down, and then most of it cancels out. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I think that's what that's what um, um, the comment said. Also, okay, uh, okay. So what was the derivative question? Or the one from 3.3? .3. Yeah, uh, it, I know it was number 57, and I can uh, look at it right now. Um, I'm 
in the textbook. So just one sec. Um, Let's see if it's going. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, the question is um, find the derivative of the transcendental function. And um, the function is going to be y equals e to the x over four root x. Okay, like that? Yeah. Okay, so find, find the derivative of this. Okay. Yeah, I know I couldn't do it when I was doing the homework. Um, I, I haven't given it a try in a couple of days, um, but I, I would like to, to go over it anyways. Okay. Um, so we're gonna need to use the quotient rule. Uh, so the derivative of the top would just be e to the x. Uh, times the denominator. Uh, and then minus, and now it, it flip flops. Uh, so we have the derivative of four root X. So the four just stays as four. The derivative of root X is one over two root X. <clears throat> or one half x to the negative half, uh, but you're gonna wanna write it this way because you're sticking it inside of a, of a big fraction. And it's gonna be a little bit easier to simplify. Yeah, I, I wrote um, two times x to the negative one half. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all good, okay. Yeah. Okay, now we got to take the denominator and square it. So that would just be 16x. Okay, so let's simplify it down. So like 4e to the x root x. Um, and I wrote it like this too, just <clears throat> to kind of separate the 4 from the derivative of root x. But yeah, you do want to simplify that stuff. So now that's going to be just 2. e to the x all over root x. And then it's still all over 16x. <clears throat> so yeah. now you need to simplify this big old fraction. Mm -hmm. um, so the quickest way to do it is to multiply by the, the common denominator of all your little fractions. Uh, and we only have one right here. So we're going to multiply everything by the square root of x to, to the top, and then also to the denominator. And what that's going to do, it's going to clear out every little fraction. Yeah, OK, that, that makes sense. Uh -huh. um, where it gets sticky for some people is they just forget that they're you know, they're taking this and they're multiplying it to the entire top. So they would only do it to like this term here instead of all of it. <clears throat> um, so if you multiply this green root X into this first term, it's gonna be four uh, E to the X times X and then minus, and then if we take that same green root X and multiply it to this, to this just the root X's cancel out. Yeah. So it's just negative two e to the X. And then underneath, it's just 16 X root X. And there's only one thing that you should do that's necessary because uh, you can't combine like terms. Uh, everything's been multiplied out that needs to be multiplied out. But if you look at your fraction, you can take a two out from every single term. So that would be the only thing that would be required for you to do. Yeah, uh, I've, I've done all that and I got there. But this is, yeah, number 57 from 3.3. And 
um, the way that they have the answer written, because uh, uh, you would say that it's okay to stop at this step, right? After you've copied this down? Yep. Okay, so yeah, so it should be 2x e to the x minus e to the, oh wait, 2x. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, over um, 8x root x. Um, yeah, but something that you could do um, is you could pull out an e to the x, like you, tr you could try to factor it. Yeah. And then you'd have two X minus one. Two X minus one over eight X root X or eight X to the three halves. Yeah. Okay, sure. But um, I don't know how they, how they get this because um, uh, so they basically have this also. Um, except on the denominator, they write it as eight X to the three halves. So, okay. But they have the two X minus one in the denominator also instead of on top. So, th so the answer according to the book is like E to the X over um, eight X to the three halves times two X minus one. And I just uh, wasn't sure how to move that down. Like this? No, no, they have because because that would mean that you're multiplying the two x um, minus one times the entire thing, right? So like that. Oh yes, right, right. So the fraction bar goes all the way over. Right. That's probably a typo. Oh, okay. Good, 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 good. <sighs> um, so <laughs> whoever was doing it probably meant to do what I originally put, or is a little fraction outside times the quantity of two x minus one, but they, yeah. The two X minus one should not be in the denominator. Okay, cool. Then, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see, this reminded me of something else though. Actually, were there any other questions on that problem from anybody else? Okay, so this was um, talked about in 3.2 and also in 3.3. Um, it was the position, velocity, and acceleration. So if your position uh, was say x of t, how would you get the velocity function? Uh, all I gave you was position, what would you do to get velocity? x prime of t? Yeah. Let's take the derivative. And then in 3.3, .3, they introduced the uh, acceleration. So how would you get the acceleration function? Um, X double prime of T or V prime of T. Yeah, so you're taking the second derivative of position to get you all the way down uh, to acceleration. <clears throat> okay, so just keep that in mind. If you're, if they want acceleration and you only have position, you have to do two derivatives to get you there. If they give you velocity, then you just only have to do to do one derivative because <clears throat> you're already halfway there. But if you start with position, you need to do the derivative twice, uh, so that can get you to. Um, your acceleration. So that was, um, what question was, that? I think that was question number five from the fourth quiz. So the quiz from uh, last week. Um, and there were different varieties of whichever problem we got, but they were kind of similar.
So if x of t uh, is equal to, um, I'm just gonna make one up, uh, t minus three all over t minus five, find uh, the acceleration at t equals um, eight. So if you just plugged in the eight, like right now, if you just plug it right into here, what would that give you? So if you uh, went, okay. X wouldn't that give you like neg negative five thirds? Uh, not quite. Uh, positive. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I meant, I meant, yeah, my bad. But what is that? The maybe your position at um at time equals eight yeah so that's going to be your position so if you plug in a t value into your position function that's going to give you um your position at the, that t value so that's not what they want you know it's great that you found it but you, you, you got to keep going because you haven't found the acceleration yet Okay, so you got to keep going right off of this. You got to first get the velocity, and then you can start getting the acceleration. So we need the derivative of x of t. So what rule are you going to have to use for that? Quotient rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the derivative of the top is just one times the bottom, and then minus, and now it flips uh, as far as the order. So the derivative of the denominator is one times the top, and then it's all over the denominator squared. So if you distribute, you have t minus five uh, minus t plus three all over t minus five squared. So from here, you know, if you have any terms that you can com combine, go ahead and combine them. Just simplify it down as far as you can. So like the t's on top cancel out and then negative five plus three is just negative two. So that right there is still just your velocity function. So if you plug eight into here, that's gonna give you the velocity. So you gotta keep going, you gotta get your acceleration. So do the derivative of the function you just found. And there are two ways to do it. Uh, one way is to use the quotient rule, which is fine. Just remember that when you do the derivative of negative two, what does that equal? Zero. That's a zero. <clears throat> so what I would do is I would just flip this up and make it t minus five to the negative two, because then you don't have to use the quotient rule. You can just use the chain rule. So pull the negative two down. decrease the power by one. So negative two minus one is negative three. And then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is just one. So your acceleration function is just four all over two minus five to the third. And now you can finally plug in the eight to give you a four over 
27. And you don't have any, any units in the problem, so you don't really have any units to give either uh, as your answer. <clears throat> All right, any questions on, on this guy or this problem? Okay, um, let's see, what other questions do you guys have? Or what else do you want to go over in just things in general? Um, anything off the notes, the videos, the homework, uh, the study guide? Um, just stuff that you've actually tried, though. Can you do 3H off the study guide? 3H. The, der oops, the derivative of ln of sine of e to the x? Yeah. That one? Yeah. Okay, so g of x is ln sine of e to the x. And we just, just want the derivative. Okay. All right, so this one's kind of the, the chain rule within the chain rule. Um, so first we're gonna deal with the ln part. So we're gonna kind of work our way from the outside and work our way in. So for an ln, when you find its derivative, you take whatever's inside of it, which is all that sine e to the x stuff. You take all of that and you just throw it straight into the denominator. <clears throat> like you don't change it at all, just put it down in your denominator. And then on the top, you take the derivative of your denominator and write it on top. So what's the derivative of sine? So that's cosine. Mm -hmm. And then the angle stays the same. Uh, and now you multiply by the derivative of the angle. Uh, so what's the derivative of e to the x? So just e to the x. Yeah. Okay, so that's, so I was trying to, I don't know why, but I was trying to go from the inside to the outside, and that was a lot simpler oh. than I thought it was. <laughs> okay, you, yeah, you can, you can do that too, it just, it starts to get a little bit trickier, because it's like, wait, what, what did I just do the derivative of? <laughs> um, and the only thing else that you could possibly do with this, so I can't remember. Yeah, doesn't that go to cotangent, I think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because you have cosine over sine and the angles are the same. So yeah, just e to the x times cotangent. Okay, okay yeah, that was a lot easier than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, what else do you guys have? Uh, 
Uh, we can also talk about any quiz questions, uh, just not quiz five. Are you going to have quiz four graded soon? Um, <clears throat> my goal is to have it done by this evening. Uh, so I've got like 30, 35 more to go through. That's a lot. <laughs> Do you have like a couple class sections of like of like this same class? I have three. That's a lot. Wow. Um, so I have over a hundred uh, taking calculus, and I have an, another forty uh, taking pre-calculus. Wow. And then you got to like answer people's questions over email and stuff too, because like they're probably all online, right? Mm hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <clears throat> pre-calculus, they don't really ask me questions. <laughs> For, I don't know. Pre calculus is just a different breed sometimes. <clears throat> and let's see, what else can we do? Um, so we can talk about tangent lines. We can. Talk more on rates. We can talk more on the chain rule, implicit, second derivative with implicit. Um, more position velocity stuff, horizontal tangent lines, vertical tangent lines. You know, uh, you've already answered all of my questions. And uh, like I said, I, I have to still do a, a section of the stuff. So if nobody else has any questions, then I should probably just like get a, get a start on that. So I guess I'll, I'll uh, just take off from the meeting and, and thank you guys. Uh, this is this is helpful and uh, hope hope to do well on the test. Thank you. You too. You're welcome. All right. Yeah, care. I'm gonna drop off too. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. <clears throat> um. All right, anything else you guys want to do, or are you derivative, derivative out? <laughs> uh, I guess I still have to take my uh, quiz five, but hopefully that won't be too bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing that today. I don't want to do a quiz and a test on one day. I wouldn't either. A lot of people do, which is fine. It's set up so you could, I guess, but yeah, that, that's a lot of math all at once it's almost four hours if you just took the entire time for both of them wow. all right uh, thank you you're welcome bye I'll see you later